perpetrators of the attack, and the Taliban were accused of harboring al-Qaeda forces. This led to the military intervention of the United States in Afghanistan, which removed the Taliban from power. But these two decades of war cost the United States both for Western powers and civilians. What is also interesting is that the government that was supported for 20 years by not just the United States and the NATO, but also by the entire international community, weathered away in a matter of days, paving way for Taliban's capture of Kabul on 15th August without a fight. The Taliban's swift return to power after two decades has left Afghanistan's neighbors, especially Pakistan, China, Iran, and Russia, scrambling to figure out how to adjust to a shifting geopolitical outlook as all of them, including India, have much to lose or even gain, depending on how and what the Taliban regime does in Afghanistan. China has already pledged humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. Pakistan wants to be a controlling party in Afghanistan. Both these countries have mutual economic and security interests connected to Afghanistan. Iran has its own fears and doubts, and Russia finds itself in a very difficult situation. All the neighboring countries, including India, are worried about political instability, likely refugee inflows, and the prospect of Afghanistan becoming a haven for terrorist activities again. The Taliban officials, however, insist that they will fully adhere to the deal with the United States and prevent any group from using Afghan soil as a base for terrorist activities. But many analysts say that Taliban and Al-Qaeda are inseparable. Will Taliban honor this promise? Only time will tell us. India has had a stable relationship with the civilian Afghan government over the last two decades, providing the latter with development assistance. The shift in power has left New Delhi in a tough strategic state, as not only has the Taliban, traditionally an anti-India group, seized power, but India's Chinese and Pakistani rivals are now poised to deepen their footprints in Afghanistan. To talk about this and much more, we have a celebrated educationist, former headmaster of the Doon School and writer, Dr. Kanti Bajpai with us this evening. Dr. Bajpai studied at the Doon School, the University of British Columbia, and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Bajpai has taught at the Doon School, Maharaja Sayaji Rao University, Baroda, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and the University of Oxford, and is currently the Wilmar Chair and Director for the Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. His contributions to the studies on Indochina relations has garnered recognition by prominent institutions worldwide. Having published and edited over 15 books and dozens of articles, his most recent book titled India vs. China, Why They Are Not Friends, has garnered critical acclaim in international relations circles. He is influential in determining what we study in school at this very moment. The NCRT textbook titled Contemporary World Politics was conceptualized by him and has been used extensively by schools across the country since 2007. His research interests are chiefly international and national security, along with foreign policy. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Bajpai with us this evening, and we look forward to his thoughts on the Afghanistan crisis and its fallout in India and China. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Bajpai. Gosh, uh, well, thank you very much. I, um, Ronit, uh, that's very kind of you. Um, you spoke so well on Afghanistan that uh, I began to th think, you know, I I'm not sure what I could say beyond that. Um, uh, but certainly you sketched in the background uh, terrifically and very articulately. And uh, it's fantastic to see uh, so many of you online. So fantastic to see you. Uh, I guess you're the head of this club. Um, with such great maturity and intelligence uh, introduce the subject. Um, before I begin uh, my remarks, I just thought I'd say uh, thanks to the school, of course, uh, Selakwi, which I visited several times when uh, Rashid wasn't there, when he was with me at the Dune School, but I was headmaster of, of the school. And uh, I just gone out of curiosity and a very kind invitation uh, from uh, the promoter of the school. Uh, of course, it's a great pleasure uh, to do this uh, with Rashid as head. Um, uh, he was one of the first uh, young uh, Turks or teachers that I hired uh, in my first year as headmaster of the Dune School in 2003. And um, he brought, along with some other younger teachers, um, great interest in public affairs into the classroom and outside the classroom. And I think, at least for my time as head, uh, that was one of my missions, uh, partly because 
because especially in boarding schools, you begin to think as a student, and having been in a boarding school myself, that the school is the world. Um, and that's understandable because uh, your entire daily life for eight months of the year or so uh, is really defined by, by the school uh, and its dynamics. But of course, it isn't the world. And um, day school students, uh, therefore, have a bit of a sense of, you know, of, of the real world, um, of the world outside the gates of the school. And I think they engage with public affairs issues uh, in a much more regular basis. Uh, they go home, they encounter people in the streets, their uh, uh, parents, friends come over, and so on and so forth. Uh, but in boarding school, um, you have the teachers, but they all get so busy with various activities and, and taking care of you. And then you just have each other, and uh, you may not always turn your attention and energies to public affairs. So what Rashid and some of the other younger teachers did was bring that worldliness into the Um, just as one last casual uh, uh, point, uh, it sort of makes me feel like I'm back in India to see all, all of you and your Indian names and, and to imagine virtually that I'm, I'm back in amongst uh, countrymen. Um, so with that, let me uh, begin. Um, I don't have a prepared text or anything like that. I thought I'll just talk my way through it and then uh, try and... Uh, leave quite a lot of time for questions and comments and quarrels with my interpretation, uh, which would be great. I mean, I think uh, that way we'll, we'll all get a, a, a more learning experience. Um, okay, so where do I want to take off from? I think I want to take off from where Renit left off, which is the question of how have the various powers around Afghanistan uh, reacted to Afghanistan? What seem to be their kind of interests in Afghanistan now? How do they conceive of the months and years ahead? Uh, everything's very uncertain. So obviously, uh, these are kind of thought experiments we're all going to have to do. You, you know, Albert Einstein did his famous thought experiment, right, on that light beam uh, emanating and racing away from the clock tower in, in Bern in Switzerland when he began to think about relativity. Uh, there are no Einsteins here, certainly not me, but the thought experiment is what we need. Sort of trying to imagine where Afghanistan will go from kind of what we know about the laws of politics and international relations and so on. I mean, I use the word laws in a loose way. So let me, uh, uh, India and China, of course, figure will figure quite a lot of what I'm going to say, but we have to take account also of, uh, clearly, Iran, which is uh, a bordering state for both Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, we have to take into account um, the Central Asian states uh, that also some of which border Afghanistan directly. Um, we've got to take into account uh, clearly Pakistan, which is so intimately tied to Afghanistan. If I can borrow the Chinese phrase, it's almost a lips and teeth relationship now, whether one likes it or not, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And, um, and then, of course, there's uh, India and China. China borders Afghanistan, India does not. Uh, it's kind of an odd, ironic thing because historically, India, when it was United India, which included today's Pakistan, was a neighbor of Afghanistan, was powerfully historically influenced by Afghanistan, uh, China probably less so. Although, just as a little trivia uh, note, I'll note uh, to you that uh, we know that Buddhism went from India to China, but what you probably don't know so much is that it actually went from parts of Afghanistan and Central Asia first to China, not directly from India. So the Afghans have played a role in Chinese history and they continue to do so in the modern period and probably will do so in, in the future as well. But they're a neighbor. We're not a neighbor anymore. Um, I think that's quite an important fact amidst all the worry and nervousness in India about Afghanistan, we still have to remember that we're not a direct neighbor that Pakistan serves as a buffer between us and Afghanistan. And that is good. And I'll come back to that point probably a bit later. So let's just uh, proceed from 
you know, Iran onwards and end up with India and China's attitude towards what's happening in Afghanistan, how, uh, what the implications might be. So very briefly, I think you'll know that before the uh, Taliban were kicked out by the Americans from power, the Iranians had quite a difficult relationship with the Taliban-led government. Um, and partly this is because of the Shia Sunni problem. Uh, Iran, as you know, is a Shia majority state. Uh, uh, Afghans are not. Um, there, are, there are problems also because the Iranians have some claims over bits and pieces of territory. Uh, the Iranians also see themselves as the local power uh, in the region, and they quite resented you know, Pakistani influence with the, the then Taliban Mark I, Taliban Mark I government. Uh, so there was that problem as well. Um, and in a way, I think also that Iran, I mean, much known for its fundamentalism and all of that uh, to a lot of people, but it's had its Islamic revolution a very long time ago, 1979. And by the 1990s, when the Taliban entered Afghanistan, you know, the revolution had softened in Iran considerably. Um, and many of the aspects of the Iranian revolution uh, were not ones that the Taliban took to. For instance, the position of women in Iran, their legislators, they're educationists, they're scientists, they're in the business world, uh, they run, I think, commercial establishments, you see them on the streets, they drive cars, as far as I remember, uh, and so on. So, you know, their attitude towards social relationships, especially with women, is quite different from the very puritanical uh, Sunni view that the Taliban held. So there was also a kind of ideological, social, political discomfort with the Taliban. And what we have to understand now is that that's not entirely gone with Taliban Mark II. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, Iran now has such an ambivalent relationship to the, this new Taliban government is precisely that. Um, and so um, it, on the other hand, uh, with time, of course, the Taliban reached out to Iran when it was out of power. Uh, the Americans had got rid of Taliban Mark I, so in a way, you know, your enemy's enemy became your friend, which is if the Taliban was America's enemy, then perhaps it could be made into Iran's friend. So Iran reached out to the Taliban for that reason. The Iranians also didn't want to lose influence to Pakistan, because again, Pakistan is a Sunni majority state, has nuclear weapons, has a population about five times the size of Iran, and could considers itself to be the kind of local superpower, and the Iranians don't like it. So, you know, there's a rivalry over the loyalty of Taliban Mark II as well. So the Iranians have a discomfort still with the Taliban, but they also don't want to uh, lose influence uh, with the Taliban Mark II. And part of that also is that if they have influence with the Taliban, and this is a theme that I think now every power is wrestling with, if they have influence over the Taliban, maybe they can stop Taliban Mark II going back to Taliban Mark I. Right. So these are a number of reasons that the Iranians want to um, uh, take a somewhat different approach this time around to the Taliban. One other reason for that, of course, is America. They're again in a, ever since Trump came Long in a particularly bad relationship with the Americans, and they don't want. I mean, it may seem a bit fantastic at the moment that the Americans could claw their way back into a position of influence in Afghanistan, excuse me, but it could happen. And the Iranians fear it. And so they don't want to give up on the Taliban Mark II so that you know the Americans have an open field to push their influence. Okay, so that's the Iranian kind of, very quickly, the Iranian interest in Afghanistan and their attitude towards, uh, the ambivalent attitude towards uh, the uh, Taliban Mark II. Take the Central Asians. I think one could sketch basically much the same picture. They share borders with Afghanistan. They have to be careful about what is exported ideologically, religiously across those borders. So they're wary of the new dispensation they have co-ethnic uh, members who are uh, Afghans, 
Tajiks and Hazaras and, and so on, who speak their language, who are the same people, but who are basically citizens of Afghanistan. So of course, they have a sense of kinship with these people and a sense of wanting to protect them against the Pashtun majority in, in Afghanistan. And you remember under Taliban Mark I, it was the Pashtun Taliban majority that really ran the show and the Northern Alliance, which was this grouping of kind of Northern Afghans related to Central Asians who got support from the Russians, from India, from some select Central Asian countries who fought and fought and were the main resistance to uh, the Taliban and who, when the Americans came in after 9-11, uh, became allies in effect of the Americans and swept into Kabul and of course became a part of the governance structure, at least briefly, quite an influential part of the governance structure uh, in the wake of 9-11 and the American invasion. So these Central Asian countries that look at uh, the new Afghanistan under the Taliban, I mean, they do have their worries again on the part of their co-religionists, the fear of Islam being exported again to them, uh, and a brand of Islam, again, that they don't like. Because you've got to remember, this Central Asia was part of the Soviet Union for a very long time. It has many, in varying degrees, many ethnic Russians living in these countries. Uh, these are white Russians, as it were, uh, Christian Orthodox Russians. And, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure from Moscow uh, to make sure that even though these are Islamic republics, that they're moderate Islamic republics, progressive republics, where women have grown up working, being in the public sphere, and so on and so forth. So again, they feel very different socially and politically from uh, the Taliban Mark II in Afghanistan. And on the positive side, they have the kind of incentives again that the Iranians have uh, to engage Taliban Mark II to make sure that they don't become too extremist, to engage them so that they aren't, you know, the Pakistanis don't have free run, so the Iranians don't have free run, uh, so that perhaps the Americans don't have free run. Some of these Central Asian countries don't have a very good relationship with the United States. So, you know, again, like the Iranians, there are several reasons why they want to maintain a kind of working relationship at least a wary friendship, a watchful kind of eye on Afghanistan, but not give up on this, this government altogether. Uh, and certainly they don't want to alienate it to the point that it will try to project its influence into these countries. So, you know, it's a double-edged kind of relationship, just like the Iranians have. And these countries, by the way, most of them are very small. They have large land areas, very few people. So, you know, influence flowing from Afghanistan, which is relatively big in the numbers of people, uh, could be dangerous. And note also that the old Northern Alliance, much of it is gone. And this time, unlike the last time, the Taliban converted some of the Northern Alliance uh, ethnic groups to their cause, uh, and they helped them get power. So, you know, the Central Asians are worried that some of their own ethnic kinfolk that previously were you know, kind of on their side uh, are now really have switched over to the Taliban. So they have to watch the situation there very carefully. All right, moving across. So now we're coming to, we'll get to Pakistan and then China and India. Of course, China, uh, Pakistan has been the great provider. Uh, we know very clearly and always have known that uh, the ISA, ISI, the inter-services intelligence of the Pakistan military has bankrolled, has trained, has um, you know, given refuge to, has manipulated and inculcated and educated uh, uh, Taliban Mark II leaderships and rank and file. I mean, there are differences here and there, but the Pakistanis have an enormous hold, even on those Taliban who don't much like uh, the Pakistanis. Uh, so clearly, I mean, there's no getting away from the fact that this is a kind of victory for the ISI and the Pakistani state and the Pakistani military. The pa Pakistani military gives all kinds of reasons for why they've done this, um, at least informally. Um, they say that, you know, uh, there was too much Indian influence in Afghanistan and they wanted a quote unquote independent Afghanistan. Uh, they felt encircled by the Indians 
who had influence under you know the new leadership after the, the Taliban Mark I, uh, they felt that uh, the Pakistanis that uh, not only were the Indians influential there, of course they were the Americans and um, other Europeans and Westerners, and that didn't board well um, for the Pakistanis either. Um, particularly because with all that influence, the retraining of the Afghan National Army, the bringing of aid to Afghanistan and so on, what if Afghanistan actually became a truly unified state, began to prosper, and as a result of that, became a threat to Pakistan? A fairly substantial power on its northern borders, uh, helped by India, allied to India perhaps, close to some Central Asian states and even Iran. So I think the, the problem for Pakistan is India and the threat of Afghanistan itself. And third, notice that, you know, uh, Pakistan has, of course, the Durand line problem. That's the putative border between the two countries, which has never been quite settled. So just like Pakistan has a problem with India over Kashmir, uh, it has a problem on the Durand line with the Afghans. And the Afghans, even under the Taliban, from everything we know, continue to make claims on the Durand line and not happy with it. Um, so there's a border problem as well that the Pakistanis want to sort out. Next problem. Uh, well, as I said, the Pakistanis are Sunni majority, Afghan is too. But all said and done, and I think we in India, we feel that Pakistan is in a very kind of extremist country in terms of its Islam, it harbors terrorism, it's got all these problems. But I think if you encountered some of these Taliban folks, you would see that perhaps, and maybe the Pakistanis feel this, that the Taliban Mark II, but certainly Mark I, was far more extremist than, than they were. And they fear a blowback of this more extremist version into, into Pakistan. Uh, and what's the real fear? I mean, not just generalized spread of Talibanized type of Islam, um, but the ability of the these groups to cause certain ethnic groups within Pakistan who are unhappy at various times to become more and more unhappy. Who are these people? Well, the Baluch, uh, who uh, want to separate. Uh, the Pashtun-related uh, people of Pakistan, uh, who inhabit the province of, of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, which was the old uh, northwestern frontier province. Um, some of the Taliban are related also to people in the so-called northern areas of uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. So there's the fear that these groups will become infected by and more radicalized and more independence-minded by, by the Taliban. And they could become, in effect, a force against Pakistan. And the whole issue of the border would become even more complicated as a result of, of their uh, relationship to the Taliban Mark II. Note also that the um, problem is that in Pakistan, there's a Pakistani Taliban, and there's the so-called Haqqani group. Uh, these are far more radical uh, up there in the border areas with Pakistan, and the Pakistan army has tried to put these groups down and has usually had to concede, more or less concede defeat. It has had to give up effective control of these borderland areas of Pakistan to tribals of this background who they can't control and they can't subdue. They've tried, unlike India, when it's had to deal with problems in the borderland, we haven't at least used the full power of the military, tanks, uh, sophisticated artillery, uh, bazookas, and you know, uh, all handheld artillery, as well as air power. But the Pakistanis have used all of that. Uh, to subdue their own borderland areas and have still failed. So, you know, you can imagine that uh, this is a very unstable region for Pakistan and the possibility that, you know, the Taliban will uh, gain greater influence, excuse me, uh, in this area and turn these forces increasingly against Pakistan is quite a scary, scary thing. Excuse me, I'm getting very dry throat from so many Zooms all day. Um, so this is the Pakistani problem. This is the fear of how things could go very bad. And let me add to that fear. If 
IS, ISIS, and if this is uh, ISIS uh, K, and if Al Qaeda, which you know you mentioned very nicely, um, if they make a comeback, then even this relatively moderate Taliban, uh, to the extent that they are moderate, could get either overthrown, and the country could succumb to some sort of, you know, IS type of entity which threatened to occur in Iraq and Syria just three to four years ago before the Americans had to go back in, the Russians had to go into Syria and are still there, by the way, fighting those elements and so forth. Um, so, you know, I mean, Afghanistan could uh, get out of the clutches of Taliban Mark II and into the clutches of these even more difficult people uh, who would think nothing of then trying to turn their guns and their influence on Pakistan to then overthrow the relatively moderate military-led Islamic Republic of Pakistan. So, you know, I mean, this is the kind of problem that Pakistan sees in Afghanistan. I think sometimes in India, we are failing to appreciate the extent to which the Pakistanis, even as they are quite triumphalist over what's happened, uh, their triumph has to be qualified by the fears that they have there. So they want control, but they also fear. Now, they also, and this is where it gets even more interesting, is that on the positive side, of course, it's great to have the Indians out of Afghanistan. Um, it's great to have, as they claim, a buffer uh, area, a, a greater strategic depth. If there was a fight with the Indians, they could retreat into Afghanistan. Or so the mythology goes. In fact, that's total nonsense, but we can come to that in Q&A. Um, but these are some of the stories that the Pakistanis have spun themselves for why you know, Afghanistan under their control is a great thing. And the last point is that, and this is one that we probably don't get as much, and I throw it out as a bit of a hypothesis. I mean, I can't prove it, but it is that you know, their relationship with China, we think that all is well between uh, Pakistan and China, but I can assure you that all is not well. Uh, the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is an extension of the Belt and Road Initiative that the Chinese have, pouring billions of dollars into Pakistan to build infrastructure all the way down to Gwadar port uh, near Karachi and so on. Uh, so much of it is being built and funded by the Chinese. There are Chinese workers and experts in Pakistan. They've been attacked, they've been kidnapped, they've been killed. They're under constant threat. Um, so it's not an altogether un a easy relationship. And, th and the Chinese have warned Pakistan if you can't protect our people in Pakistan, we'll have to do something about it. Now, those are ominous words from the, from the Chinese. Uh, also, I mean, no country, uh, I think we uh, think that the Pakistanis are just a poodle of the Chinese, but you know, uh, there's a phrase in English, the tail wags the dog. Sometimes the weaker party has a has more influence than you think over the stronger party because it has bargaining power as well. What is Pakistan's bargaining power? It's a country with nuclear weapons on, on the lip of China. I mean, today they're friends. Tomorrow they may not be friends and China has another nuclear neighbor. Uh, it has one of the biggest militaries in the world in terms of conventional military power. Yeah, it's got about, I think, 700,000 troops and an air force uh, sitting on China's border. Uh, it is a Muslim country. Uh, and we know Pakistani Muslims have gone into Xinjiang province, uh, some of them, to help out with the Uyghur resistance to the Chinese. And the Chinese are extremely sensitive about the Uyghur problem, as you know. So uh, the Pakistanis know that, and they don't like the fact that the Chinese may take them for granted might try to boss them around, might try to exploit them in ways that they don't like. And by the way, the Pakistanis are masters at dealing with more powerful countries. I mean, whether we like it or not, they have dealt with us, even after they lost Eastern Pakistan, they still have held off India and its India's Indian power and Indian influence. They have dealt with the Americans, arguably the, still the most powerful country in the world. They know how to manipulate, manage, and hold off the Americans. So I think they're entitled to think also the Pakistanis that they can manage the Chinese and Afghanistan gives them, 
you know, that kind of latent threat, that potential threat to China, that if you try and push us around too much, you know, watch out for what might happen in Afghanistan next to your very vulnerable areas of Xinjiang. So you see, I mean, everyone is playing uh, uh, several games here, and mostly they're all double games. They're all ambivalent about what they can get out of Afghanistan, how they can use Afghanistan, and how Afghanistan could harm their interests at the same time. Yeah. All right. I'll just quickly come to China and India, and then I want to stop because uh, I've gone about half an hour already. So I'll try and wrap it up in about five or six minutes. Um, I think the Indian part I'll do the quickest because, I mean, we're all Indians. You probably have thought about it quite a bit too, and I'm not sure what I can add that's very original. But on the Chinese side, you know, um, of course, they, first of all, they have, they see advantage here. The Indians are out, uh, the Americans are out, the Western Europeans are out. These are all the kind of strategic rivals or enemies for uh, China. Their ally, Pakistan, has won. Their influence is strong. Um, Afghanistan, therefore, could be brought over to the Chinese side completely, integrated into a Central Asia, where China now, along with the so uh, Russians, uh, is the most influential part. Uh, in fact, in some parts of Central Asia, China is far more influential than the Russians because they have the money bags. They buy the oil. Uh, they train parts of their military. Uh, they border areas that the, Sov uh, the former Soviet Union, Russia, doesn't border very much anymore. So their their impact is enormous. They have masses of Central Asian students in their universities. So they would like to integrate Afghanistan into their domination of Central Asia, and thereby, you know, have uh, to do what? Well, partly to make sure that Afghanistan remains moderate, partly to exploit, as you've heard, some of the enormous mineral deposits that may be in Afghanistan. Not quite sure they're still commercially viable, those deposits, but, you know, they could be uh, to make sure, you know, that um, uh, nobody else gets back into Afghanistan. So they want a, a kind of grip on Afghanistan now. But of course, the, the major interest there is to make, make sure that the Taliban maintains an independent Afghanistan, but a moderate Islamic republic there. And they certainly don't want IS Khoran and Khorasan and uh, the um, uh, Al Qaeda to be back there. Uh, they were very grateful for the Americans after 9 11 uh, for clearing those people out, the Al Qaeda people. So uh, China now, you know, again, is also ambivalent. Uh, it's wonderful to see the Westerners depart, the Indians uh, get kicked out, uh, but it's not so nice to now have the Taliban right on your doorstep uh, with the possibility that uh, ISK and, uh, you know, um, uh, Al-Qaeda would be on the doorstep of Xinjiang, uh, possibly causing great harm there. So the, the Chinese, I think, the uh, Chinese have other ambitions that are positive. They want to probably run roads through Afghanistan directly to Iran. So not just a road running, an infrastructure running from China right through to the Gulf through Pakistan. Pakistan, but an alternative route also, which is always wonderful strategically to have redundancy, uh, to be able to run uh, roads through Afghanistan into Iran and into the Persian Gulf, where, of course, China imports masses of uh, oil and, and gas from and exports goods to. So, you know, it's a business proposition as well. Um, and it reduces their reliance on the Pakistanis. And by the way, the pa Chinese have ambivalence about Pakistan. So, they would like to gradually get some influence in Afghanistan to, uh, I wouldn't say to balance Pakistani interests, but to give the Taliban an alternative source of, of power uh, so that they're not in, in uh, debt to the Pakistanis altogether. Um, so you know, why does China have a problem with Pakistan? Well, as I said, it's uh, 280 million people or whatever the figure is uh, and growing. Uh, it has nuclear weapons and a, a rather impressive conventional uh, military right on Pakistan's doorstep, and it can be a nuisance in Xinjiang. So uh, again, you see the Chinese also uh, very ambivalent about the relationship with Afghanistan. And this is the story, I think, with India as well. Much as we're very upset by the developments in Afghanistan and the takeover of Taliban Mark II, I mean, you can see that 
India too has its ambivalences. It must now be that way because we've got to, in India, make sure that for exactly the reasons the Chinese, the Iranian, Central Asians all have certain interests, uh, we don't want it to go completely into Pakistan's hands. We don't want ISK and Al-Qaeda to become too influential. So we want to, to that extent, make sure Taliban Mark II of a moderate kind remains in the seat of power. Um, we want to also, out of some concern for all the infrastructure we built there, the developments that we, we funded, uh, the people we protected and nurtured there who were our friends in Afghan society, that we can exert some influence over the Taliban to make sure that these people are not imprisoned, uh, badly dealt with, you know, uh, tortured, killed, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So there's that kind of uh, concern. Uh, we don't want the Iranians to have too much influence there either, because the Iranians have been quite difficult over some of our problems. They've criticized our handling of Kashmir, for instance, even when they've been friendly to us. Um, so that's another reason that we have a stake in Afghanistan and a, a relatively functional, moderate Taliban mark too. So, uh, and of course, we want to limit Chinese influence there. So we have an incentive to get back in good, as they say, with the present rulers of Afghanistan, but how to do it, of course, at the moment. It's embarrassing. Uh, even though the Taliban have reached out to us, we know that there are different forces within the Taliban, some who are more moderate, probably looking to us for a certain amount of a relationship, some who hate us and could sabotage things and embarrass us all over again. Um, so we've got to be a bit careful. And I think the Indian government, quite rightly, is not hurrying into a recognition of this, this government, because that's the one thing we have that the Afghans uh, under the Taliban would want is um, recognition. Uh, and why from India? Because India still has a fair amount of influence and cachet with much of the developing world. So if a so-called secular or Hindu India, whichever way you think of India, um, uh, gets friendly to or recognizes Afghanistan, it'll be a signal to a lot of countries out there that, well, okay, uh, then maybe it's okay to have recognize Afghanistan. So I think India doesn't want to give that card away right now. Um, also, I'm sure the Americans are breathing down our necks uh, and so are other countries saying, please don't do anything right now uh, to recognize the Taliban. But eventually that moment will probably come. And uh, you'll have read the commentaries, I think, already in the Indian press arguing both sides of the case. But it seems to me that that will happen. Let me stop there. I think what what could India and China now do together? I mean, do they have any common ground? I mean, I can let you into a little secret, which is that we've had dialogues here in Singapore at my institute, which I organized over several years. It's a dialogue between, which has stopped now for the last two or three years, but uh, of India-China dialogues. A very high level Chinese and Indian uh, delegations came, small ones, had very intense direct negotiate, not negotiations, talks. They weren't the Indian side were not officials. Uh, India never sends officials to these so-called track two dialogues. But they came and one of the things that was talked about, I remember one of the liveliest sessions was Pakistan and Afghanistan, where it was very obvious that there is a convergence of interest over stability in Afghanistan for all the reasons I've laid out. Fear of a, a fundamentalist, extremist, unstable, underdeveloped, uh, you know, uh, Afghanistan, which would then be up for grabs from an, a number of powers like the Pakistani, the Iranians and others who neither China or India would like to see in power there. So there's a convergence there. Uh, there's a uh, convergence too in some of the economic possibilities. India would love to, you know, India has helped build some facilities from Iran up connecting a road up through and it hoped to lead the road all the way into Afghanistan and then on to Central Asia. So India still has a bit of a fantasy that it could get, because it can't get through Pakistan to Central Asia, but it could run around Af Iran into Afghanistan. So that's, and, and the Chinese, of course, as I said, have huge commercial interests and a road that, running the other way uh, that they would like to develop. So there are commercial interests in common. Um, I think uh, 
uh, uh, both would like to limit Iranian influence beyond the point uh, as well. Um, so let me stop there. I think uh, the, the last point is that we haven't talked about the Russians and, and the Americans and so on, but what are the possibilities? One would be uh, of how the international community might think about the Afghan problem. One answer is a concert of power. So the Iranians, the Pakistanis, the Russians, the Indians, the Chinese get together and perhaps the Americans and sort of begin to put pressure on the Taliban government, work with them, but pressure on them to run the country in a way that is acceptable to them. The other is a sort of balance of power. So you have the China, Pakistan sort of uh, influence there. And then you have perhaps Indo-Iranian, some Central Asian uh, kind of influence. And a third factor would be you know, uh, the Russians and possibly the Americans. So one of the conspiracy theories going around is that the Americans, since the Doha negotiations with the Taliban, have basically figured out that they want to use Taliban Mark II as a dagger pointed at the heart of China. So just as they had a containment structure against the Soviet Union with a ring of countries around the Soviets uh, to, if, uh, to try and you know, hold the uh, uh, Soviet power in check. So they would also like to disturb the Chinese in Xinjiang and increase their bargaining room with the Chinese uh, over that by perhaps turning the Taliban against. But, you know, so the Americans might eventually also become a player in a balance of power game where India, China, et cetera, et cetera, don't all combine, but they balance off each other's influence. And, you know, that gives uh, a cer certain kind of stability to uh, uh, um, uh, Afghanistan because nobody lets the competition uh, get out of hand. Uh, I mean, a third is, of course, that Afghanistan is somehow stabilized by the Taliban and everyone is happy to have a neutral uh, Afghanistan where nobody exerts too much influence. It becomes a kind of Switzerland. Uh, completely neutral with respect to the big powers, and the big powers just leave it all alone. Not very likely, but like Switzerland, it's landlocked and it's managed that that kind of scenario very well for hundreds of years. So let me stop there. I've spoken much longer than I, I wanted, but I wanted to give you a pretty full picture. I'm happy to talk as long as you like, but um, I know you probably have dinner and other, uh, other kinds of uh, things to do. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Bajpai, for your thoughts on such a critical issue. I understand that it's too early for us to predict what may evolve in the region in the coming days, but we can all pray for the Afghan government to be inclusive, anti-terrorist, and yeah. be friendly to its neighbors. Before taking questions from the audience, I personally have a question to ask, sir. Mm -hmm. Out of the current and last three presidents, uh, George Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and now Joe Biden, who do you believe to be the most responsible for the disaster prevailing in Afghanistan today? And if asked to rank these four presidents concerning the US-Afghan policies, what will be your ranking, sir? Yeah, well, I think the safe answer is uh, George W. Bush, uh, Jr. I mean, uh, it was understandable that the Americans struck in Afghanistan after 9-11 because Al-Qaeda was there. I mean, there are people who argue that that wasn't the best decision. There are other ways of controlling Al-Qaeda, maybe even trying to work with the Taliban and the Pakistanis to get uh, al uh, the Al-Qaeda, uh, especially the leadership. Uh, but nonetheless, it was understandable that they did it. Uh, but of course, under George Bush then, they never quite figured out you know, uh, what their policy was going to be. So there were two factions, broadly speaking, and those have remained. Uh, one was we're here just to do counterinsurgency and uh, sort of counterterrorism, clean out Al Qaeda and, and, and those elements. And then the job's done and we can probably go away. And then there was the nation building uh, faction in American policymaking, which is uh, no counterterrorism just means that some other group, if not Al Qaeda, will be back at some point and we'll have the problem all over again. So we've got to fundamentally change the governance structure improve development um, uh, on the ground, change the political and social structure of this country such that they themselves will never allow you know, uh, extremism to flourish. And they dithered and you know, kind of oscillated between these different factions or points of view. And I think you know, that just brought a kind of incoherence. 
Um, and as my, uh, well, my old Dune School friend, Gautam Bukhavadia, uh, who was ambassador in Afghanistan, has been saying recently, the Americans built a, or tried to build a counter-terror force in the, in the Afghan army. So that became a military force, which, like the American counter-terror uh, military forces, was really built out in a, in a kind of react to, you know, a terror strike or prevent a terror strike. But it was not an army of, you know, deployed to control large tracts of territory, as a national army would be in, during a civil war. Uh, and it depended very heavily on the Americans supplying air power, artillery power, drones, and so on, and so, and communications, and so on. Um, and not they didn't train the Afghans enough in that. So when they pulled out, eventually, they left an Afghan army that had become so dependent on the Americans for backup and communications and air power that they were lost once they encountered a really determined foe in the field. Uh, so I think that's the problem is, is that they fell between two stools, focus just on counter terror, forget about nation building, leave it to the Afghans to run their own government, uh, which became more and more corrupt and ate up all the money that was poured in there and so, and then do nation building. And I think the, the various precedents at various points kind of wavered between these. Obama tried to pull out, not greatly successfully, although he did bring down forces fairly substantially, and then had to send them back in to try and reestablish control at some point with the surge. Um, oddly enough, so I would say Bush was certainly, first of all, responsible. Obama, you know, for all his other great qualities, foreign policy and external relations were never great under him. And he was always very kind of wavering. Um, I mean, he got what's his name, of course, in the end, um, you know, uh, hell of, of Al-Qaeda. But other than that, you know, he, he wavered. And then to be fair, I mean, much as I'm, I'm no Trump fan, I, I can't stand him. But at, at least he finally saw the clarity, which was that it was too late. The Americans now really couldn't hold on much. And they had to start making. Now, having said that, the way he conducted the Doha negotiations was shambolic and almost immoral. And he left, uh, I think, Biden very little choice. So my ranking would be really in chronologi chronological order. Uh, Bush, then Obama, next most responsible, I think. Uh, then Trump, and last of all, Biden. Biden had very little, very few cards to play. I mean, he wasn't inclined to stay on anyway. But uh, I would say he didn't have much choice, really. Thank you so much, sir. I will now open the house for a few questions. Interested students can raise their hands and wait to be called out. Kindly introduce yourself and put on the video and audio as you speak. I see something in the... Uh sort of chat box or whatever it is. I don't know Teams very well, but I don't see anyone speaking, <laughs> so. Um, Ali, you can go ahead with your question. I see a lot of hands there, but um, yeah, there's Ali, Anushka, Ridhi, Jeffreen. Do we have a connectivity problem or what? Am I visible and audible? Yes, you're audible. Uh, good evening. I am Ali Yawa from Great Den. Uh, Dr. Bajpai, do you see any difference between Taliban part one and the new Taliban regime? Do you think it will be different this time? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. If I, I wish, if I knew the answer to that, I would probably be very rich, but uh, I don't know the answer altogether, but I mean, I think the initial signs were quite good. Uh, they seem to be their promises of not taking revenge, uh, allowing women into the workplace and schools and universities and all of that was positive. Uh, they stuck to their promise of letting the Americans and Westerners get out, uh, you know, and uh, I think are still allowing the few people who are 
a few is probably the wrong word, but whoever's left behind still to get out, either through Pakistan or uh, probably quite quietly some Western flights are coming in and taking them out, uh, or through Afghan um, Central Asia and so on. So I think those are all the positives. Um, they've reached out to countries like India, uh, obviously, so that's, that's good too. Um, so far, we know there haven't been any huge numbers of killings or massacres and so on. On the other hand, every day we are waking up to some contradictory signs. Uh, I think they've said already that, I mean, there's no one, no women in the cabinet that was just announced. Uh, there are no uh, women, um, uh, women and men won't be allowed in the same classroom. I think in some places, girls are being told to stay at home, not come to school. And they've also said that at, at the workplace, if a man can do the job that a woman was doing, then the man should do it and the woman should stay home. But then as soon as that came out, perhaps some other group within uh, the Taliban fold said, oh, no, 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 this is temporary and uh, wait to hear the next bulletin and definitely women will be allowed to be educated. They will be allowed to be in, in, in uh, the workplace and a certain amount in public life. So I don't know, it's a very uneasy uh, time. Um, I mean, if I had to bet, I would say they can't really afford to be as bad as the first Taliban because now the world knows uh, what they're like and capable of. And um, there's a lot of their funds that are that's frozen. Um, and, you know, I mean, uh, there are elements that will, will strike back uh, possibly, including the Americans if things get bad. So uh, I don't mean land troops there, but there are, there are, as the Americans say, over the horizon ways of striking Afghanistan, which is drones, missiles, and so on. Um, I don't think they want to alienate the Chinese. We're very nervy about their rule also. So, uh, yeah, I just think it's too early to tell, but I'm, I'm a little optimistic. I mean, optimistic is a strong word, but a mm, bit positive that they won't be as bad as the previous lot. I mean, a lot will depend on the factional battles within. And of course, the relative strength of the ISK and uh, Al Qaeda. I mean, those guys could be very extremist and dangerous. And you know, when they make appeals, those others, to very fundamentalist kinds of um, ways of life, uh, then that may cause the Taliban to you know kind of go extremist as well to make sure that they don't gain a certain amount of popularity. Uh, because I mean, you know, Afghanistan is quite a, a, a conservative place. I mean, we we shouldn't imagine that all Afghans uh, are unhappy with you know fairly extremist fundamentalist uh, you know uh, rule. Um, as many are, but um, uh, many are also not. Uh, they welcome it. So you know, there's a constituency that IS, K, and uh, and Al Qaeda can appeal to, and so Taliban don't want to give them too much political space as well. Okay. Next question. Jeffrey, you can go ahead with your question. Am I audible and visible? Yeah, yeah you are. You're audible, <laughs> not visible. Great. Wait, I switched on my camera. Am I visible? Yeah, you are now. Okay, great. Um, good evening, sir, um, headmaster and teachers and all the fellow sequins. Um, so, considering India's and China's population, which builds up to almost 40% um, of the world population, so it's evident that, you know, it would be in everyone's interest that both countries should live in peace. Mm -hmm. So, my question to you, Mr. Bajpa, is that what, according to you, are the underlying differences between these two nations? that are actually preventing them from living in mutual harmony. Yeah, well, you can see my book there. So that's the thesis of my book. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, actually. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, it would take me a whole different session to do, uh, do that. But basically, uh, the book describes four Ps that divide India and China. The first P is their perceptions of each other. And the thesis in the book is that from a positive beginning of good perceptions, particularly China's uh, very respectful attitude towards India because of Buddhism, up to about 900 of the Christian era, um, 
you know, it's gone from that to a Chinese view of India, which is very disdainful towards India, seeing India as a country of enormous divisions, disorganization, poverty, uh, uh, bad governance. Um, they have very racist attitudes based on color towards Indians also. Um, so I'm not saying all Chinese are racist, but I'm saying that there's quite a substratum of a mix of these kinds of feelings towards India, that it's a third rate power. And actually, I mean, I'm very sorry to say, but many of these kinds of criticisms that they level at India, we would level about ourselves. Uh, they, our democracy is chaotic, nothing gets done, uh, it's underdeveloped, uh, it doesn't live up to its potential, uh, it's divided by race, uh, I mean, not by race, by caste and religion and region and language, so they can never get it together, these Indians. So, you know, this is where it's, it's gone. And to some extent, I mean, of course, on the Indian side, there are bad feelings as well, equally racist um, and, um, you know, kind of uh, with all kinds of uh, cliches and caricatures about Chinese people. They all look alike. They all speak alike. They're all homogeneous. They all think alike. They have no uh, ability to criticize their government. Uh, they're undemocratic. Uh, they're all violent. Uh, they're hegemonic. Uh, they want to boss everyone in the world around and so on. So, you know, we give it back to them with all these kinds of cliches, uh, which are also not very disrespect, uh, very respectful. So that's the first problem. There's a very deep structure now on both sides of mutual bad perceptions. That's the first P. The second P is contest over the perimeters, which is just a fancy way of saying the borders and Tibet. And there's nothing on the borders today that we can agree on pretty much on the perimeters. We can't agree on the alignment of the line of actual control. We can't agree on the alignment of the border as a result. We can't agree on where the troops even are physically and where they should be. We can't agree more or less in crucial areas in about 14 sectors where patrolling is legitimate or not and what kind of patrolling. Um, so we don't agree on who started what when there are these episodes, we think the others started it. Um, we think that the other side broke all the agreements. They think we broke all the agreements on confidence building measures and you know on what the troops can and cannot do in the border areas. So, and there's a fundamental distrust that came out of the early years going back to when they both were unsure of their perimeters. And you gotta remember India came out of partition Nehru and the first government were trying to bring a constitution into being, get a unified country, deal with the fallout of the violence of partition, you know, uh, get the constitution written and so on, you know, and, and put down all the norms and ways of functioning, federalism, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Indian troops had come back from World War II and, and, and there, there was poverty, underdevelopment and all of that. And the Chinese, likewise, we came out of partition, they came out of a civil war. Uh, we came out of World War II, they came out of World War II. In fact, their war started much earlier. It started in 1937 when the Japanese invaded. And by the way, after the Soviet Union, they lost the largest number of people in the Second World War through civil war and fighting the Japanese. So there was devastation in their countryside. Uh, they were still struggling to get control against, in the civil war, against the Guomindang, who then left for Taiwan. But there were many remnants that they had to clean up. Uh, and they had factional fights within the, Cong uh, within the Communist Party, just as Nehru had to face the opposition in India and so on and so forth. So, you know, th and the maps, you see the maps on both sides, they had multiple maps. India had to get some of its maps of its own border areas from Britain because they were locked up in British libraries. I mean, they, we had maps, but we had to get some from there. We didn't even have control over our own maps. So how could we know our borderlands clearly? Likewise, the Chinese, I mean, they'd come through a civil war. Their maps, where were they? Some were probably taken away by the Taiwanese, by the Guomindang under Chiang Kai-shek to Taiwan. So both sides were saying, we'll get back to you. We don't quite know where the border is, but we do actually have a historical record that says this is ours, that's yours. Um, uh, don't worry, we'll come to an agreement. And every time they said that, which was reassuring. They also did stuff that was not reassuring. Nehru reassured the Chinese, but then he, within a few weeks of uh, meeting uh, 
Joe and Lai, he suddenly published new maps uh, uh, unilaterally from India, claiming Aksai Chin and what we now call Arunachal Pradesh. And the Chinese were left scratching their heads, like, oh, well, we just met you, but you didn't show us the map. You didn't say anything about the maps at that point. Chinese did the same thing. Zhou Enlai reassured Nehru that eventually they would do a deal in, in uh, if they could get Aksai Chin, uh, they would not make a claim in uh, Nifa, which is now Arunachal Pradesh. But then later on, Joe and Lai said, oh, did I say that? No, 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 you misunderstood me. I didn't quite say that. And then they had maps that the old Guomindang had left behind. And Nehru said, oh, but your maps are claiming so many parts of India. Uh, and they said, oh, no, don't worry about those maps. Those are the maps that the Taiwanese, the uh, Guomindang had. Those are not our maps. And yet their embassies just after that were going around publishing those maps. So the Indians were left scratching their heads going, you just reassured me about the maps and now you're claiming those are the maps that you're gonna go by. So, you know, I mean, on both sides now, give you another example historically. I mean, I can't repeat the whole uh, 60 years of the negotiations and so on that we've had, but my grandfather was the first head of India's foreign service, Girja Bajpai, and he was part of a group with Sardar Patel who was arguing with Nehru to say, agree to a border deal contingent on Tibet. So we will recognize their control over Tibet, but make sure that we get a border agreement in return. Don't agree to, you know, sign a Tibet deal until they give a... And then there was another faction led by K.M. Panika, who was the Indian ambassador in China, the historian, who was saying, no, 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 don't provoke the Chinese right now. This is not the time. Let's get control over our borderlands before we do anything. So there was a sooner school so let's soon quickly strike a deal with, led by Bajpai and Patel and some others, KPS Menon, Shivshankar Menon, our former national security advisor's grandfather, uh, arguing whole Tibet to the border issue. And then there was Panikkar and then Nehru in the middle somewhere inclining towards, let's not alienate the Chinese. Just to finish the story, the Chinese had exactly the same factional problem. There were map-making officials in Tibet who wanted to do a de get into the negotiations with India immediately because they thought they had a strong claim and they thought China was in relatively strong position after the civil war. But Zhou Enlai and Mao said, no, hold on. They were the later school. They said, no, hold on because we're not strong enough yet. We're fighting the Korean War, which broke out in 1950. We're consolidating power at home. Uh, we've got an economic development problem uh, and we don't want to take on the Indians in, on top of it all. So, you know, they also were divided. Now, both sides were genuinely divided, but as a result of this, both sides couldn't quite believe what the other was saying because the positions were changing. Nehru, uh, much as I admire many things about him, he made so many different statements. Sometimes he would say, the borders are absolutely clear. There's nothing to discuss, Some, no, to, nothing to negotiate. Then he would say, oh, no, we can discuss but not negotiate, if you can understand that difference. Then he said, oh, yeah, we're not sure of Aksai Chin being ours. But other times he said, no, we're very clear on Aksai Chin being ours. Uh, and likewise, the Chinese, sometimes Zhou Enlai was saying this, sometimes he was saying that. Sometimes when he came to India in 1960, in the last big negotiation, he once again offered a swap. You get Nifa, we get Aksai Chen. Nehru said no, but he made the offer. But then a few weeks later, he was apparently almost going back on that offer. So, you know, I mean, you can't build trust like that, you know. And um, and the last point I make is, and this is one that continues. I mean, it's not just Nehru; it's in our political cultures. You see, I mean, we inherited from the nationalist movement a view of politics and our borders that took over from the British, that things would be done by rule of law, by constitutionalism, by looking for a basic legal principle on which we would delineate the border, you see? And a status quo view, colonial boundaries should not be changed. Otherwise we'll get into a lot of messy problems in the, in the world because there's so many colonies out there. The Chinese under Mao and the Communist Party had exactly the, the opposite view. They weren't concerned with 
these fuddy-duddy legal ideas and forensic arguments. Because if you know your Marxism and communism, they think that legal and other arrangements are all like Maya. You know, we say in Hinduism and Buddhism is Maya, illusion. The real thing is who has the power below, you know. And so they take a strategic view of negotiations, not some abstract principle of law, but we come to a bargain, we do a deal. But Nehru was not that. He was a lawyer by training. And we go in India still in a political culture of kind of the courts, the law, the whereas the Chinese think strategically. They're looking for bargains and a deal, you see? So our political cultures don't meet. When our bureaucrats go up and meet theirs to discuss the border issue, it's like they are talking something, talking past each other. Anyway, that's the second P. The third P is, uh, very quickly, is we've never been on the same side in partnerships. That is. We were with the Soviets in the Cold War. The Chinese were mostly first with the Soviets, then the Americans. After the Cold War, we're with the Americans. The Chinese are with the Russians. Uh, we have been with the Russians and the Americans as allies, and the Chinese have been allies of the Russians and the Americans, but we have never been allies with the Chinese. So our top-ranked military political leadership have never worked with each other. You see, of all the big powers in the world, we're the only two who have never been allies except briefly in World War II when we fought against the Japanese together, but that was British India anyway. And the last P is, and this is really fundamental, and there's no need to rehearse much of it, you all know the facts and figures, the power difference, we went from a position in 1960 or even as late as 1980 of about parity with China, economically particularly. Today, China's GDP is five times India's size. Its per capita income is four times India's size. You go to a Chinese city, there's no Indian city, anything like it. I mean, Mumbai looks like some backwoods, you know? So it's a huge difference. Uh, the military is not so severe, but soft power, which is the power of persuasion, the Chinese score higher. It's, one has to get into that argument to see it. But if you add it all up, China's much more powerful and they know it. And when they know it, they don't see why they should make any concessions to India. If I'm more powerful, why should I concede to you? You will bow down before me at some stage. And on the Indian side, because of the power difference, we've got the opposite problem, which is precisely because we're weaker, we can't give in because it'll look like surrender. And if we surrender on anything, the Chinese, it'll be the slippery slope. The Chinese will want more and more concessions. We'll turn into a tributary state. And Indian civilizational pride and the politics of India would simply not allow any leadership to concede to China on those grounds. So how do you deal with that problem? I mean, logically, it's only when this power gap can be bridged, this fourth P, that, and we can look the Chinese straight in the eye, and they have to look us straight in the eye, that we can get closer to a resolution of our problem. I mean, we still have to work on the partnership issue, the perception issue, and finally solving the border problem. But it seems to me that you have to bridge the power gap. And that's the enormous challenge that your generation above all will face, is how does India gear up almost to a civilizational change to become a major power? Because it just ain't there. Don't read this nonsense in the media. We're so far behind China. I mean, that old trope about, oh, India and China, both rising powers, we're going to be... We're nowhere near, <laughs> nowhere near. So that's why we can't be friends. Somil, now you can ask your question. Sorry, I'm just looking up there because my air condition is leaking, so. Or shut it off. Go ahead, Somil. Somil. Am I still audible? Yes. Oh, I'm really sorry. No, you're loud and clear. Go ahead. Um, there has been a glitch. Perhaps. Uh... I mean, now you're not clear. <laughs> I can't hear you. 
I'm uh, sorry for that, sir. I think Swamil can go ahead with this question now. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Normally, you're not audible. Parth, now you can go ahead with your question if Somal is not audible. Am I visible and audible? Yeah. Good evening, sir. My name is Parth Kapoor. I'm in grade 11th. My question for you is being a product and a headmaster of a boarding school. Do you think boarding schools need a makeover in terms of engagement, facilities, policies, etc.? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by engagement with whom. And what what kinds of policy changes? I mean, are you saying how should boarding schools be changed? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I mean, I think. It's a big question. Boarding schools are not very important in India. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> you may have thought they are, but they're a very minority group of schools. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say they're not important. They've pioneered a lot of things. And uh, I think your headmaster is still trying to pioneer certain things, especially trying to bring the boarding schools together and, and so forth. But uh, they pioneered a lot of stuff in education and co-curricular uh, life and so forth. And they have a place in India because there are students who for various reasons, have to you know get their education away from home or prefer to. So I think that's important. Um, but I think that you know just like India needs to reform and catch up with the rest of the world, I think Indian boarding schools also have to catch up with boarding schools outside of India, you know, in uh, different parts of the world. And so they have to catch up on, of course, on pedagogy, which is how you teach and and, and learn. Um, I think they have to catch up, certainly in terms of facilities. I know the facilities of Seliqui are very modern and, and very nice, but a lot of the boarding schools don't have that yet. Um, I think they have to catch up in terms of um, the, the kind of social life of the school, which is probably what you're getting at a bit, uh, the relationship between students, the relationship between students and uh, the faculty, the teachers. These are always... I was going to say contentious. They're not contentious, but they're they're always a project in motion, you know, uh, because times change, attitudes change, students change, teachers change, the head changes. Um, so, but I think the most fundamental is, um, I think you know, the social life has to be more civil <clears throat> uh, and respectful and. Uh, I mean, a hierarchy in a boarding school up to a point is necessary between students because the older students have to uh, watch out for younger students. But I think uh, there has to be a very deep appreciation that that hierarchical relationship is a, is a relationship of service, not a relationship of bossing people around. Just as our members of parliament are supposed to be the servants of the Indian people, not, I mean, they don't act like that. So they're like boarding school prefects most of the time. Uh, bossing people around, taking advantage, being violent, uh, and misbehaving. Uh, sometimes senior boys and girls in boarding schools are like that, but that's not what you're supposed to be. <laughs> you're supposed to be uh, caregivers, in effect. And in return, uh, the younger students are supposed to uh, uh, give you respect and look up to you. But uh, this ethic of caregiving and civility on both sides, and then, of course, between students and faculty, I think you know, that's very important. And other boarding schools and other systems have it more. They have their own problems. They've got drugs and alcohol and sometimes a bit of quite an attitude towards the faculty, uh, which can border on being outright rude. Uh, but so, I mean, we have our strengths. I think we tend to not yet have that problem so much. But um, I think at the level of the students with each other, especially in all boys boarding schools, Maybe not so much in Seliqui, which is a co-ed school, but in the single sex schools, the hierarchy can sometimes be an unhappy thing. 
And certainly Dunas had its problems so have the other boarding schools. There's no point pretending that's not the case. It may be the case in your school too, between uh, the boys to younger boys and uh, girls to the younger girls. So I can't say, and it's not my business to say about your school, but I think those are the kinds of things that they have to evolve in, uh, in boarding schools in India. Um, and the last is that, you know, there are two choices in terms of the balance between curricular and co-curricular. So I think um, Doon and other boarding schools have gone the way of making every everything so compulsory and loading you with so much and then expecting you to deliver academically as well, that kids are exhausted, stressed, hyper competitive, you know, no leisure time. If you don't give someone a, a leisure time, their brains can't develop, frankly. Uh, I mean, they may get 97% in their board exams, but uh, their uh, intelligence in a longer term sense is not developing. Um, so how to do that? I, I think in the boarding schools abroad, you're given much more choice about what you want to do. Do you want to play sports every day? Do you want to be involved in four clubs and debate and blah, 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 and run two school newspapers and, and also play sports or whatever? Um, so they, I think they go much easier on that. They give people more time and space to develop as personalities, as intelligences. And it has the physical effects too of you know not stressing you out so much and hurting your health. And I think it reduces some of the hyper competitiveness so you don't get that uncivil behavior as well. So a lot of the problems that come out in boarding schools is from too much competitiveness, you know, uh, between students as well. So I think uh, those are a few thoughts. I mean, I'm too far away now from Indian boarding schools to say, and I'm not very close to other boarding schools. So, uh, but I would say those are at least, and I, th I think, you know, on the management side, but that's a different conversation. The managements also have to evolve in India. And, uh, but that's not an appropriate discussion here with you, all of you present. So I'm not going to say anything more. Um, so since Somir wasn't able to ask his question due to technical difficulties, um, yeah. I will continue with this question. Yeah. So, so you've been a headmaster of a boarding school as well. Did you find that more challenging compared to your present role? Uh, well, yeah, it is actually. That's quite uh, astute of you, uh, which is to say that uh, it's a if if your head of a boarding school is 24/7, 12 months in the year. In fact, it's busier when the students are gone. Uh, you may think that Rashid goofs off, and so do the teachers. Uh, the teachers may get a bit of a break, but the head will never get a break because the head has to catch up on report writing, managerial issues, appointing new teachers, answering to his 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 board, uh, you know, and all of that. So, uh, and doing workshops with teachers and, and, and. So actually the holiday months are even busier for the head of a school than the term time, at least I found that. Um, and it may be that that's very particular to Doon because we have a very layered governance system there. Board of Governors, a society that runs the school with 200 members, the Old Boys Society, uh, and on and on. So there, this multi-layered governance makes it a full-time you know, uh, engagement. But, um, and second, the, as a university professor, college professor, you don't deal with parents. I mean, all those years I ran a hostel in JNU for nine years, and it was tense in other ways and difficult. But I didn't have parents coming to my doorstep and saying, you know, Mera ladla beta, uska kya hua, aur uske marks dekhe, aap log kuch karte nahi ho, you know, board results aise kaise, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So university students don't bring their parents. You don't have to deal with them. And it's understandable at the school level, obviously. You're younger, the parents have to t look out for your interests more. But even in a boarding school now, particularly with phones and all of that, when I was a boy at the school, I mean, my father never came to the school, never visited me. And my mother never came. Uh, my father never even asked me about my school days, to be honest, ever. He didn't read my reports. Uh, but I mean, you know, that's a bit extreme, but um, it was a very different experience. But today, parents are engaged and they're uh, in touch with the school and their kids constantly. So again, I don't have that uh, as a university professor. I don't have to worry about that. I deal with the students as adults and we have other issues, but we don't have that. And the third is that it's harder teaching uh, 
uh, younger students. Um, the most difficult are, you know, kind of like kindergarten, the first few years in school, three, four, a third or fourth standard kids, because they're very hard to discipline. And of course, it's not very appropriate to discipline them in any way. Um, and they're still learning to learn. And, um, you know, so it's a very difficult, uh, but, you know, even up to the age of you guys, 17, 18, your, st your brains and your emotional centers neurologically are still growing. A lot of the discipline problems of schools with teenagers is not just because they have a bad attitude or, you know, that uh, their homes are unstable or something, but there's stuff going on in your, in your brain, your hormones and uh, your kind of uh, neurological development that just makes you difficult, <laughs> you know? So some are more difficult than others uh, and misbehave. Here is it cannot be excused, but I'm just saying that that's not the case by the time people have got to be 19, 20, 21. It's still there a bit as undergrads, but by the time I only teach graduate students, that is what we call postgraduates in India, 21, 22, up to people who are in their 30s. So these are full blown adults. They're easy to manage, relatively speaking. Um, and, I mean, we don't have discipline problems in a classroom. We don't have uh, really don't have discipline problems in the hostels and so on. So yeah, I mean, it's a much easier life um, as a professor. Uh, I mean, it has its own challenges, but they're never of the order of the administrative, pedagogical, and discipline, you know, kind of social life of students uh, kind of problem that you have at the school level. Um, so yeah, I, after, I mean, I knew it already notionally, but when I was head, I realized what a, difficult job it is to be a school teacher, especially a secondary school teacher. And my admiration for secondary school teachers is enormous. <laughs> I mean, I think they have. And by the way, there's one other thing, which is every year, a school teacher and the head is answerable to the parents in the court of public opinion. And it's like you're in a company, you're answerable to your shareholders. How are you answerable? Because every year there's a board exam. And you're going to have to answer why you did badly, if you did badly. Whereas I don't answer to parents. I don't answer to the dean of my school even. He doesn't care. I mean, he does care, but he would never think to say, oh, you know, your grades this year are not as good as, uh, of the students are as good as last year. Whereas every year, like, Management has to answer to shareholders. Uh, Rashid and the teachers have to answer to parents and school management on your results. That's another very big pressure on uh, school teachers and heads of school. May I now? Why do you think Rashid, Rashid had a full head of hair at one point, you know? So, thank you, sir. May I now request the headmaster to say a few words? Thank you, Dr. Bashfi. I know we are running a bit late for dinner. I think uh, boys and girls must be all waiting for their Tuesday night dinner, which I'm not sure what it is. But you know very much uh, what food is in a boarding school. Yep. But uh, let me thank you formally for being with us this evening. It has taken a bit of soft uh, power to get you here. Persuasion. And yep. I think uh, it was uh, every bit uh, worth it. Uh, Dr. Bajpay, of course, uh, you know, you're coming from an uh, illustrious family of diplomats and also uh, the boarding school. I'm sure uh, that many in your family who went to Doon. Uh, I remember vividly that probably that your father was the first school captain of Doon. Yes, And correct. also the first uh, editor in chief of the school weekly. Uh, so I think uh, for all of us and especially young sequence, it has been a matter of pride uh, for them to be listening to you, both uh, on the issues of boarding school and also on the issue of uh, Indochina, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and other players uh, that are integral uh, part of it. I do understand that it's uh, some of some of those talks are of course a bit heavy for this 14 to 17 years old, but uh, it's important that uh, boys and girls are uh, shown uh, what the win you know window outside is like. I think it's a uh, Important to let that uh, wind come inside a boarding school, which can be always like an like an idol. 
so your influence on my headmastership and of course as a young teacher has been tremendous and uh, while well, i have done it enough time in terms of thanking you personally and professionally but uh, uh, you'd be glad to know that some of the things that uh, uh, you did at dune uh, of course i have taken it uh, to say like especially in terms of giving chances to young uh, graduates to come and teach so we are very uh, committed a uh, good young teachers uh, on campus and i think uh, that's what the way should be uh, we should uh, invite and we should make teaching a uh, very commendable uh, job uh, and lucrative of course for uh, young teachers so with these words i uh, must uh, say thank you once again and uh, well done ronit i think you handled dr bajpai very well <laughs> uh, not yes, many can i can assure you uh, thank you sir thank you very much it's been a great pleasure and uh, just one word on teachers it's the one profession where uh, they give everything they have and never expect really anything much back uh they will share all their secrets and tips and all their knowledge uh and i don't think that's really substantially true of any other profession and it's the great promise and joy of teaching so with that thanks a lot it's been lovely uh, great to see you rashid uh, thanks a lot to, uh, uh chairman of lyceum uh and uh, uh i'm sure we'll meet somewhere at some point good night all Thank you, Dr. Bajpai, for giving all the sequence such an insightful session. I strongly believe that this made us all very well versed with gravy marinade classes at hand. Thank you and good night.